I have heard the President on uh, several occasions indicate that we, uh, if we support his policy, should come down to the White House or uh, just introduce resolutions in support. Uh, I believe that Article I, Section 8 requires just the opposite, that the President must come up to Capitol Hill uh, to request such authority. The second thing that I think has to be made very clear is that my understanding is that the President has stated either privately or perhaps even semi-publicly that if Congress were to deny the authority, if the Majority Leader's uh, resolution were to pass, by way of example, that the President would feel free to ignore uh, the will of Congress and move without congressional authority. Uh, Mr. President, I have uh, stood on this floor on many occasions arguing constitutional uh, issues uh, uh, in opposition with the White House, uh, the most uh, recent uh, perhaps dealing with uh, the requirement that I believe the White House has to give prior notice on covert actions. Uh, there, I think there is some ambiguity, obviously, in the interpretation of the respective powers of the executive and the congressional branch. But here, there is no doubt in my mind. Here, it is clear and unequivocal that Congress has the sole power to declare, and the President uh, has the sole power to execute. And I think we ought to be very, very clear on that issue so that we don't find uh, attacks later being made uh, uh, at the President or upon the President for uh, exceeding his constitutional authorities. I think that we ought to debate that issue certainly as part uh, of any decision on the Majority Leader or Minority Leader's uh, resolutions. The President has a duty to inform, uh, to educate, and to inspire, uh, not to dictate and not to decree, and he does not have an army that serves at his pleasure. And this, for me, is not simply a quibbling over constitutional interpretation. This is fundamental to an allocation of constitutional power. But secondly, and equally importantly, I think, that if the President were, in fact, to suggest that if Congress were to reject his request for the use of authority, he would proceed in its absence. I think that is uh, not only constitutionally wrong, I think it is tactically wrong, because it makes it much easier for people who are faced with a tough decision to simply say, if it doesn't matter what my vote is, then I might as well vote on the popular side of the issue and the way my mail is running or the phone calls are running. It lets many people avoid that tough decision by saying, if it doesn't matter, why should I support the policy? So I think the President, if he in fact is advocating this, and I do not know only what I've heard or read, that he is making a mistake, and I hope that he would not uh, support those particular provisions. I have not had a chance to really review the Majority Leader's uh, resolution uh, based upon what I heard being read just moments ago, I think that there may be one provision missing, uh, and that has to do uh, with the uh, authorization for the use of funds to conduct an offensive war. If it's going to be the position of the majority that the President uh, should not proceed to conduct an offensive war against Saddam Hussein, then I think we have to give serious consideration as to whether or not Congress should also debate whether funds should be made available to conduct such an offensive war in the absence of a declaration or authority given by Congress. Otherwise, I'm afraid that we may find uh, a situation developing where members of the Senate or the House uh, may say, Mr. President, we disagree that you have authority to go without our permission. Uh, if you do go, we will support you, and then we'll deal with the fallout later. Uh, the fallout later might very well be a series of impeachment resolutions filed in the House of Representatives saying that the President had exceeded his constitutional authority. And I would not want to see that occur if, in fact, it can be avoided in the initial instance. So that's something I think that we have to look at uh, in debating the Majority Leader's uh, resolution, or indeed that uh, of, uh, of the Minority Leader. Uh, Mr. President, there has been some uh, question about whether or not this debate, or our debating over the past several weeks, uh, is seen by Saddam Hussein as a political de defeat for President Bush. Uh, that may be the case, uh, and that is because Saddam Hussein uh, looks through the flat eye of the fanatic, uh, and he uh, rewards those who dissent uh, with a bullet in the brain. But debate is the very essence uh, of a democracy, uh, even when it's inconvenient to a president or indeed embarrassing to a president. And no one, and I want to repeat that, no one should question the motivations or the patriotism or the political aspirations of those who choose to disagree with the President because war or the best way of achieving peace is the business of each and every one of us. 
I'd like to take a few moments, Mr. President, to review how I believe we got where we are today. I believe that we're paying the wages of past sins uh, and of lessons lost. Uh, back in 1973, we found ourselves stretched over an oil barrel, and we vowed at that time, and I remember, remember it very well, to become energy independent. We preached and we practiced conservation, knowing that the cheapest barrel of oil was the one that we didn't have to produce. Within 10 years, our memory and our willpower has faded. Tax incentives for conservation were terminated. Big cars returned to the highways. Speed limits uh, were lifted. Cons consumption, rather, soared. Discipline died. And now, once again, our economy is tied to the wildly oscillating prices of foreign oil. We may have no choice but to confront Saddam Hussein now, but it would have been far better to have made war on energy waste in the past than on Baghdad tomorrow or after January 15. There are other free nations also addicted to oil uh, whose conduct has helped to produce the crisis in the Gulf. Uh, I would cite specifically the French who were eager to help Saddam Hussein build a nuclear uh, capability at Osirik, which the Israelis destroyed back in 1981 to everyone's condemnation and relief. The Germans who transferred chemical weapons technology to Iraq as well as to Libya. The civilized world, including the United States, that refused to condemn Iraq and punish it for using chemical weapons against the Kurds and the Iranians. We, in fact, only slapped Saddam Hussein on the wrist, and we said, don't do it again. And in the wake of his utter disregard and contempt for international accords and standards, we increased trade to the point where Iraq became our second largest trading partner in the Arab world. Apparently, we thought we should engage in a behavior modification program, believing that continued trade and assistance would moderate his behavior. In fact, uh, most of us recall that just one week prior to the invasion, his invasion into Kuwait, we were on the floor offering an amendment to cut off all trade with Iraq. And at that time, many of the members who are now supporting actions against uh, Iraq including the administration and with the aid and assistance of the administration, actively oppose any attempt to terminate trade with Iraq only one week prior to his invasion. We now find ourselves acting in concert, I cannot bring myself to use the word alliance, with Syria, a nation that is at the very top of the list of terrorists incorporated, with China, who at this moment is engaged in the trial of students who demonstrated for democracy back in Tiananmen Square, and all the while we're urging a traditional friend, Israel, to lower its profile, to be silent as we whisper to the Arab nations that we will exert pressure on Israel and help bring about an international conference on peace in the Middle East. With respect to our allies, uh, a great deal has been said about the disproportionate burden that we have had to bear. Uh, much more needs to be said and done about those allies. Again, I return to Germany, which has been so meager in its contribution to the crisis, in assisting in the crisis, and now so eager to rush to Baghdad with its diplomatic hat in hand. Japan, which is almost wholly dependent upon a stable supply of Persian Gulf oil, has been penurious, to say the least, in its financial support of our effort, while its private companies are busily buying up Hollywood. And I believe the conduct of Germany and Japan will have long-term consequences in this country and should have long-term consequences. But their disappointing, deplorable performance shouldn't deflect us from the central issue that confronts us. Is war justified? Is it justified to liberate Kuwait? I would suggest the American people would say no. To defend the Saudi royal family, I would again suggest the people of this country would say no. To protect oil? It's far too cruel an equation to trade an ounce of blood for a barrel of oil. And while most of us flinch from the notion that we should ever fight over oil, the overwhelming majority of the members of this body and the country support keeping 250,000 troops in the Saudi desert to do precisely that. The central question for me, and the one that justifies sending our young men and women into battle, is the threat that Saddam Hussein poses for the United States in the future. Now, not much has been said about the need to reduce the size and capability of the killing machine that all of us have helped to build. 
There has been a suggestion that if Saddam Hussein returns to Baghdad, we'll be able to cause his military to sort of wither away through the enforcement of sanctions. I must tell you, Mr. President, I don't believe that's possible. A little over a year ago, and I see my colleague from Oklahoma, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, and he will recall this well, we discovered that Libya, with more than a little help from our friends, had constructed a chemical weapons plant. We alerted the world. We sounded all the whistles, blew all the horns. Look what has happened. Uh, we talked to the chancellor, apprised him of what his private companies were doing. We hoped that we could stop the completion of that so-called pharmaceutical plant. But according to recent news accounts, the plant's been completed. It's ready to go into production of toxic gas and nerve agents. So if the present is prologue, then we can take little solace in the ability or willingness of those companies who smell a profit, even in a canister of poison, to refrain from selling more weaponry to Iraq. Most Americans applauded the strike against Muammar Gaddafi after they learned of his connection to the bombing of the LaBelle discotheque in Berlin. And it stopped his terrorist activities, at least for a while. But I have to ask the question, what if Gaddafi possessed nuclear weapons or had a so-called crude device that his agents could explode in New York City or Washington, D.C.? Would we have t attacked Libya at that time? Perhaps, but perhaps not. Which brings me to the issue of nuclear weapons in the hands of Saddam Hussein. The evidence on this is conflicting, and the senator from Maryland has obviously, uh, Senator Sarbanes, read extensively the testimony presented to the Senate Armed Services Committee. The evidence on this is conflicting. We have had estimates that it could re be in six months, possibly a year, possibly three years, maybe even 10 years. I don't know whether he could develop a nuclear weapons capability in six months or six years. What I do know is we've been surprised before. And again, I refer to my colleague from Oklahoma. We were surprised when Saudi Arabia acquired a, an IRBM, an intermediate range ballistic missile capability from China. That surprised us. We were surprised with Iraq's ability to extend the range of Soviet-made Scud B missiles. That too surprised us. We were surprised when Libya acquired its chemical weapons plant. We were astonished when Iraq was able to nearly put a rocket uh, into space to launch a payload into space with its Tammuz uh, three-stage rocket. And we have to remind ourselves what can be put in space can also be launched across the Atlantic. So the evidence with respect to his ability to acquire nuclear weapons is unclear. But the argument is made that even if Saddam Hussein acquires nuclear weapons, uh, we shouldn't become insomniacs over it. After all, we have faced nuclear weapons uh, in the hands of Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and Dropov, Chernyenko, Gorbachev, Deng Xiaoping. It strikes me that this particular rationale is similar to what lawyers call pleading in the alternative. My client wasn't there. If he was, he didn't commit the assault. If he did commit the assault, he was provoked and acting only in self-defense. And even if he wasn't acting in self-defense, he was suffering from temporary insanity. That's what we call pleading in the alternative. And much can be said about the same thing as far as it applies to Saddam Hussein. He doesn't have nuclear weapons. He can't get them for six months or maybe six years. Even if he could acquire them in six months, it would only be a crude device that would have to be delivered by a truck or a 747. And even if he could put it on missiles, Iraq wouldn't dare to use them for fear of retaliation. Again, perhaps not. But it strikes me as curious to say the least that we now have a capacity to obliterate Iraq, and that doesn't seem to have deterred him so far. And the notion that he would have more consideration for his people after he acquires nuclear weapons than before strikes me as dangerous self-delusion. Whether he acquires them in six months or six years, he eventually will have them. And he will have an intercontinental range for his ballistic missiles. And that means that the wheat fields of Kansas will fall under the same threat as the oil fields of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. And even if he feared a retaliatory strike by the United States and was deterred from attacking us directly, I have no doubt, I have no doubt that his very possession of the weapons would intimidate other nations in the Gulf and force them to capitulate, all except Israel. I have hoped, and I must say I have prayed time after time, that sanctions would be sufficient to bring Saddam 
was sane to his senses. But I've had to consider what he has forced his people to endure. He's forced them to suffer.